Hi, my name is Will Towns, um, and yes, I'm a postdoc um, in, in the Princeton Computer Science uh, with Barbara Englehart, who I believe um, you have had as part of your seminars previously. Um, I, um, I did my PhD in biostatistics with uh, Rafa Irizarry up there um, in, in your neck of the woods. So a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about um, towards the end is um, work that I, that I did with him, as well as um, Stephanie Hicks and um, Martin Ari. Um, whoops. Okay. So I'm going to talk about two kind of topics that are, they're sort of separate. So the first one is the generalized linear models. And um, I'm going to drill down um, and focus on um, how you actually optimize a GLM. Um, and then I'll shift gears and, and transition more into the latent factor models to help prepare the way for, for just talk. So a lot of this stuff is probably a review for folks, um, but uh, they're just so widely useful, I hope that it will still be of interest. Um, so basically the way a generalized linear model works is, um, it's, it's essentially a regression or a classification type of, um, type of model where you have um, some number of, of predictors and uh, an outcome and you wanna explain the relationship between the predictors and the outcome. Um, so we could think about collecting data for um, a bunch of pairs of observations and X being a vector of all the different um, predictors and Y is usually uh, just a scalar. Uh, it could be uh, uh, counts or it could be uh, binary or it could be real valued. It's, it's sort of open-ended. Um, <clears throat> and the key thing is that we're going to model the Y, the outcome, as a random variable. Um, where the mean is some function of, of the x, and the x being the, the covariates or predictors. So just as a, as a motivating example, if you think about differential expression um, for just one gene. So if you're looking at one gene and you have um, x could be sort of like the indicator variables for your biological condition, um, and then y would just be the expression level of that gene you know, in each of the replicates. So there's three components or ingredients to uh, GLM, the exponential family likelihood, the link function, and the linear predictor. And I'll explain each of those in more detail. The exponential family is really the most interesting part of the GLM. Um, this is just a broad class of probability distributions. Um, and the way it's defined, there's, there's some slight variations in the definition, but um, this is the one I'm going to work with. I'm kind of glossing over um, dispersion just to keep it simple. Um, but you have what's called a natural parameter. And the reason it's natural is because the way it interacts with the, with the data is through an inner product. Um, and this could be a vector or just a scalar. Um, then you also have this function that's only a function of the natural parameter, not the data. And you have another function that is essentially just for the, to make the probability distribution um, integrate or sum to, to one. This could be a, a, a PMF or a PDF. I'm kind of using the same notation for both. Um, so the C of Y part is usually the least interesting because the, the theta is the parameter that we, we want to actually learn. Um, now this cumulant function, which I'm using as a kappa, has a lot of really interesting properties. Um, so here's just a few examples. You can, if you write out the, um, the log of the, the PDF or PMF of just many well-known random variables, you can sort of rearrange the terms and, and just try to identify what's the natural parameter and what's the cumulant function and so on. So with the Poisson, um, you know, we, we first just look where's where's the data y, and then what's what's multiplied times y. So log of lambda, so log of lambda equals the uh, natural parameter, and then um, you know you can invert this function and get um, lambda as a function of theta and plug that in, and then you can see what your cumulant function is. The cumulant function is always a function of the natural parameter, so that's why you have to 
it can't be a function of, of lambda, for example. <clears throat> so another example is the binomial distribution, um, you know, where the natural parameter is uh, the log odds. Um, and this is the cumulant function. I'm not really expecting folks to, to see this instantly. It's just basically to illustrate that um, you can go through this process of, of rewriting the, um, the PMF and, and try to um, identify these, these parameters to check whether something actually is an exponential family or not. <clears throat> Finally, the, the Gaussian or normal distribution is, is also um, exponential family. Uh, and here, when, I, when I'm talking about sigma squared, I'm actually assuming that that's just fixed, just to keep it simple. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm not really going to cover dispersion, but um, there is a generalization of all of this theory that includes dispersion parameters. Um, so, so that was that would be where that would come in. But if you just consider sigma squared to be fixed, um, then the natural parameter is actually this mu over sigma squared, um, and this is the the cumulant function. So what's interesting about the cumulant function is you can pull out the mean and the variance by taking the derivatives of that function. Um, so the, this, this um, definition here is very general to any, um, <clears throat> any probability distribution um, as long as it doesn't have uh, tails that are too heavy, like, like this doesn't work for, um, for the uh, log normal distribution because its, its tails are too heavy. Um, but as long as this expectation is defined, um, if it's an exponential family, you can um, do this integral uh, it, it basically in closed form. Uh, and, and you can see that the moment generating function has this nice structure, which is just um, the difference, essentially the difference between two evaluations of the cumulant function. And there's also something called the cumulant um, generating function, which is the log of the MGF which you can see is just the difference between the cumulant functions. So to obtain the moments from the moment generating function, um, we just take the derivative uh, and set, set t equal to zero. This is all just basic probability theory. Um, and you can see that it, it falls out that the expectation of the, of the variable is the derivative of the cumulant function. And the variance, so this is the, the second moment, but the variance is the second central moment, so you have to subtract off um, the mean squared. And so you can see that the second derivative of the cumulant function uh, just gives you the variance. So this is really handy um, because we often want to parameterize regression models through the mean, and we want to know um, what the functional form of the variance is. Um, so as long as the um, derivative of the cumulant function is um, invertible, which usually it is, um, you can actually write the natural parameter as a invertible function of the mean. Um, and what that means is um, we can define the variance as a function of the mean. And this is a, a really uh, um, hallmark of generalized, of exponential families and, and generalized linear models is um, you often, um, discuss a choice of um, distribution based on the, um, the variance function. So what functional form do you want the relationship between the mean and the variance to be? So as an example, you know, with Poisson, the variance equals the mean. With Gaussian, the variance is a, is a constant with respect to the mean. Um, and, and so uh, another interesting property is if you take the derivative of the natural parameter with respect to the mean, again, assuming this is a invertible function, then um, sort of like the inverse of the derivative is like the derivative of the inverse, um, sort of a property from, from calculus, as long as it's a monotone invertible function. Um, so the, what that means is if you, if you take the derivative of um, natural parameter with respect to the mean, it actually turns out to be one over the variance function. So this is just to really emphasize that the variance function shows up everywhere. And, and sometimes people even just, um, you know, define their GLM just purely based on the variance function. They don't even bother with, with dealing with um, natural parameter or, or anything like that. Okay, so that's 
those are some of the main interesting properties about exponential families. Um, and the other two components are a little simpler. So basically, um, the idea of the linear predictor is that we're going to take our, our measured predictors x, and we're just going to multiply them by some, some real valued um, coefficients vector. So this is exactly the same thing that people would do with linear regression, um, you know, except instead of um, saying that the mean is equal to um, this linear uh, combination, um, we're actually going to say that there's this, this is called the linear predictor, actually. And it's not the mean. Um, because if you think about it, um, if, if this um, covariates are real valued and the um, coefficients are real valued, this linear predictor could take on any value it, real number. Um, but for many interesting probability distributions, um, the mean uh, cannot be real valued. So with the Poisson distribution, the mean has to be positive. Or with the um, Bernoulli, it has to be between 0 and 1. So in order to fix this problem, we're going to just um, squash uh, the, the real line into whatever um, you know, open interval uh, that, the, that the mean can actually take on. And the way we do that is through a link function. Um, it's, it's basically just a, um, it, it could be any you know, smooth monotone function. Um, and it usually needs to be monotone increasing. Uh, but I think there are some, I think with the gamma distribution, it, it might actually be monotone decreasing, which makes it kind of weird to interpret. But um, so very common approach, you know, if you're mapping from the reals to the positive, you can use, um, you know, e to the x or, uh, you know, for mapping to some um, bounded interval, like with the binomial, you can use um, a, a, a logit uh, logistic sigmoid function that looks like an s so but there there's really a total open-ended choice you can you can really use anything as long as it has those basic properties so here's just a catalog of some popular choices um so i already mentioned the the the, the note the uh nomenclature is kind of confusing because in statistics um they define the link function as a mapping from the mean to the reals but when you're actually writing it out, it's easier to think about mapping from the reals to the, to the mean. So, so it's actually the inverse of the link function that is really more interesting. I think it's just an unfortunate um, historical artifact of, of the statistics literature. Um, so watch out for that. You, you might get tripped up if you prefer, if you're from more of a computer science background, you're going to be wondering why these statisticians are, are doing things that way. Um, well, uh, well, it's Alex. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so in the, sorry, I want to say this. It, it can't just be, can it just be any function or is there some like deeper reason? Cause I mean, the log for the Poisson and the logit for the binomial certainly feel like they're related to the functional forms that you had, uh, on the earlier slides when you talked about the natural parameters. Um, can you yes. say a word about like, cause, cause of course there's other functions that would squash in the same way. You know, there's, there are algebraic functions that would do that. Why these? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's kind of what I've got here. I've got canonical link function and then non-canonical link function. So um, what canonical link means is it literally um, is, is whatever function um, that forces the linear predictor to actually be the same thing as the natural parameter. And, and that's very popular because um, it, it simplifies the computation of derivatives and things like that. Um, and then sometimes, most of the time, but not always, it, it tends to make things a little easier to interpret. Um, but um, I'll show later that uh, there's, it's with negative binomial, for example, almost never do people use the canonical link function. They, they use the, the log link because they want the interpretability that comes with, with that link function. So, I see. To, to think of that, that as over-dispersed Poisson in that case, probably. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Every, every family has a different canonical link function. So if you okay. have two families that you want to kind of compare the coefficients as the same interpretation, you might you know, choose to use a non-canonical link function 
and you're going to have a little bit of extra computation when you're doing derivatives and stuff, but it's really not that big of a deal. Um, cool. That's really helpful. Thanks. Yeah. And another thing that's, that's kind of neat about these link functions is um, I'm not going to go into this too much, but um, there's something called a probit model, um, which is often compared to a, um, a logistic regression model. And it turns out that um, it's just a different link function, but you can interpret these link functions, especially in the um, binary case, as, um, as the cumulative distribution function of, of a kind of latent variable. And if you choose um, a latent variable that has um, heavier tails, then um, the, the corresponding link function will actually be more robust to outliers. So this is sort of a way that you can control um, uh, the robustness of, of the binary classifier by modifying the link function. So if you go from a logistic regression model to um, like, for example, this binomial um, Koshitz, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, this word actually, um, but this is using a Cauchy latent variable instead of a logistic latent variable um, and as we all know, the Cauchy distribution has very heavy tails. So this uh, link function would actually um, cause the classifier to be much more robust to um, extreme outliers uh, when, you're, when you're doing your, your fitting. But in practice, um, often the difference between these link functions uh, is, is not that big um, unless you have some crazy data. Um, but it's just nice to know that, that you do have a choice. Okay, so putting it all together, um, we have our linear predictor, which I'm using eta to, to represent. Um, this is real valued and it is just the inner product of um, a vector of covariates for a particular observation times the regression coefficients. And the regression coefficients are really the thing that we, we want to learn. Those are unknown parameters. Um, we map this real valued thing to um, the mean through this monotone um, you know, link function or inverse of the link function, um, we can define our natural parameter as being a function of the mean. Um, this is based on just whatever we choose for our exponential family um, outcome likelihood. And then we have our, our log likelihood function. So this is a complete recipe for, for a GLM. Okay, so now how do we actually figure out what is the best um, regression coefficients um, vector? Uh, so again, this is, um, let's say we have K, um, K being the number of, of covariates or predictors that we have. So this is gonna be a, um, a real valued um, K vector. Um, so the way that, um, we will classify the best um, beta is we're going to define an objective function. So, um, you know, and it could be anything. It could be, you can make up your own loss function or whatever, but for the sake of um, illustration and also to maintain consistency with tons of theoretical stats results that suggest this is a really good objective function, um, I'm going to use the log likelihood. So. Um, statisticians always want to maximize the log likelihood, which is basically saying that you're going to pick the value of beta that maximizes the probability of the data that you actually observed. So anytime I try to explain these frequentist um, uh, ideas, I always get tongue, tongue twisted because sometimes you have to wrap your head around, you know, what's random and what's, uh, and what's fixed. Um, you know, spoiler alert, I'm kind of more from the Bayesian school. So um, sometimes I feel that it's easier to interpret things with a Bayesian perspective, but this talk is really mostly a frequentist. Um, yeah, so this is sort of the, the definition of the maximum likelihood estimator. Um, but if you prefer to minimize things, like pretty much anybody who's doing something with uh, machine learning usually want to minimize the loss function instead of maximizing the um, utility function. Um, just do minimize the negative um, of the log likelihood. It's, it's equivalent. 
Um, and to further strengthen those connections, um, a lot of the most popular loss functions that people use with neural nets and so on um, turn out to just be equivalent to um, the, the negative log likelihood of, um, of uh, particular GLMs. So um, there's several different terms. So there's, um, I mentioned negative log likelihood. Um, there's also something called deviance. So this is basically the same thing as the negative log likelihood, um, but there's just a, um, a constant term that's different um, that represents what's called a saturated model. Um, I'm not really gonna go into that too much, but whenever you hear people talk about deviance, it's basically, um, it's more or less the same thing as the, the negative log likelihood. And this deviance thing um, is often used to assess um, goodness of fit. Um, finally, there's a thing called Bregman divergence, which is um, not very well known by statisticians, but um, it's, it's a really broad class of, um, of uh, discrepancy. They're not really metrics, but ways of, of uh, measuring, you know, how far apart things are. Um, and uh, it turns out there's a paper from, uh, I believe it's Banerjee um, et al, where they show there's essentially a one-to-one -one correspondence between um, regular Bregman divergences and, um, and exponential family likelihoods. So if you hear people talking about divergences, a lot of times you can switch back and forth between that and, and uh, probabilistic um, GLM type of way of thinking about things. And sometimes that enables you to, to think about the problem in a, a you know, a complementary way. Um, so squared error loss uh, is just a Gaussian likelihood. Um, all of this stuff is like plus or minus some additive constants that don't matter when you're when you're taking the derivative. Um, cross entropy loss is Bernoulli likelihood. And there's in in um, non negative matrix factorization, there's this Kolbach Leibler um, loss that people sometimes use and it turns out to be the same as um, uh, using a Poisson likelihood. And there's many others, just beta divergence and Itakura, Saito, and some more exotic ones that are less often used. Um, so here's a visualization, finally. <laughs> Sorry for all the equations and stuff. But um, these, are, these are what the loss functions actually look like. So um, everybody knows that the, the Gaussian loss, so this is, um, this is essentially the negative log likelihood. Um, so what I've done here is the colors are just, it's literally, I'm assuming that I have one data point and the X axis is the predicted mean that I'm gonna use if I fit a GLM with just an intercept term only. So it's very, very simple. Um, but the idea is if the true value is two, so the data is two and I predict the mean to be three, then I incur some, some loss. And the minimum value of the loss occurs um, when the mean that I predict is exactly the same as the actual data point. Um, and so you can see as you go away in either direction with a, a squared error Gaussian loss, the penalty is the same. It's a symmetric um, type of loss. Um, but then in contrast, if you think about a Poisson loss, um, especially for very small counts, which, you know, are very common with things like single cell RNA-seq, um, that this loss really doesn't look like the Gaussian loss. So, um, you know, it, it increases very sharply if you um, under predict, but it increases much more slowly if you over predict. So there's a kind of asymmetric, um, um, you know, penalty there. Um, and then it, the interesting case where you actually observe an exact zero value for your data, uh, it turns out that the loss function is actually just this, this linear function of, of the mean. So, um, so hopefully that gives some um, more intuition about um, how these loss functions look. I mean, they all encourage you to choose the correct value for the mean, um, but it's more about, you know, if you, if you are off by a little bit, is it better to over predict or under predict? depends on the, the choice of loss function. Okay, so I'm gonna talk now about um, different algorithms for doing the optimization. Um, so a first order approach, basically you just need the gradient, which is often called the score in the statistics literature. I don't really know why it's called the score, 
Um, so for that, you need to be able to take the derivative of the mean um, with respect to the linear predictor. So this is essentially the derivative of the inverse of the link function. Um, so for most commonly used link functions, this is known, it's a closed form, you know, this would be, you know, e to the x or something like that. Um, you need to know the variance function as well. So if you go through the chain rule, um, I'm going to kind of skip through this sort of quickly, but uh, it basically uh, boils down to um, your data minus the predicted mean, so sort of a residual, um, and then you divide by the, the variance um, and multiply by this, um, this derivative and then multiply by, by um, the covariance vector. And you can stack all of this stuff into a matrix form um, which looks like this. So H and V would be diagonal matrices. Um, and then Y minus mu is just, uh, is just a vector. Um, so for, you know, something like gradient ascent, because we're maximizing the log likelihood, um, we initialize our beta vector. Um, then we do a forward pass thinking about it in terms of like neural nets. Uh, this is a neural net basically, but there's just no hidden layers. <laughs> um, so um, we do a forward pass to compute the, the predicted mean, and then we do a back propagation, which is only one step of back propagation to get the, the gradient. Um, and then, you know, you've probably all seen this before, you take a small step in the direction of the gradient uh, and just keep repeating that until co convergence. Um, so what's more commonly used with these um, GLMs is uh, second order optimization, which just means that we're going to take advantage of the second derivative as well as the first derivative. And because um, all these functions kind of have nice properties, um, we can actually get this um, second matrix of second derivatives uh, in closed form um, if we know what the variance function is and we know what the link function is. Um, so if you just directly compute the Hessian matrix, I apologize that you're having to look at this giant wall of, of symbols, but the point here is that you can get it in closed form, um, but it's kind of a mess. Um, so what people like to do in stats instead is use this thing called Fisher information, which is essentially just the expected value of the, um, of the Hessian matrix. Um, what's really the negative of the expected value. Um, but as you can see, it greatly simplifies. Um, so this is really going to save you a lot of um, computational expense. Um, and if you convert it into a matrix representation, you can see it's uh, sort of this uh, cross product. And again, the H and the V inverse are diagonal matrices. So it's sort of a weighted cross product of, of um, your covariance matrix X. I don't really want people to dwell on this too much, but just to emphasize that there are two different types of um, matrices, they're positive, definite, and all that, um, that people would use um, for these second order optimizers. Oops. So um, if you use just the straight up Hessian matrix um, from numerical analysis, there's the, the Newton's method or Newton-Raphson algorithm um, which is basically saying that um, you have your gradients and you have your previous um, uh, estimated value. And instead of just taking a small step, um, we're going to uh, rescale the gradient essentially to take, to take into account the, the local curvature of, of the objective function. And this will um, hopefully allow things to converge faster. Um, and we can simply replace this Hessian with um, the, the negative um, of the Fisher information um, and, and it'll, it should give a similar uh, type of algorithm, but much simpler computation. And it turns out that these two algorithms are actually going to give exactly the same update rule if you use the canonical link function. So going back to, uh, to the comment from earlier about um, why do people like to use the canonical link function? Well, it also has this nice property that you don't actually have to choose between these two algorithms um, because they're going to be equivalent. Um, so this is um, just rearranging the definition of the Fisher scoring algorithm 
um, to point out that it can be thought of as a weighted least squares uh, step um, where you change the definition of the outcome to be this pseudo outcome, which don't really want to get into too much detail, and the weights are given by this um, uh, H times V inverse times H matrix. Um, so this is just to emphasize that a lot of times people talk about fitting GLMs with iteratively reweighted least squares, um, and it turns out that that algorithm is exactly the same as, um, as the Fisher scoring algorithm. So if you do Fisher scoring, which is really the default choice uh, in most um, GLM software packages, um, another convenient property is that if you take the inverse of this Fisher information matrix at the point of um, convergence, then that gives you your, um, your covariance matrix for the, for the parameters. So that will allow you to get confidence intervals and p-values, and there's a lot of theory from stats um, to, to show how this, um, this asymptotic distribution you know, converges to a nice normal distribution. Um, there's also a lot of connections here to the Bayesian uh, maximum a posteriori and using a Laplace approximation for the, for the posterior, but I don't have time to, to go into that. Um, but they're very close, they're very, very similar. Okay, so here's an example of um, doing the optimization. So this is a negative binomial um, with only two um, regression coefficients, so we can visualize the um, likelihood surface in two dimensions. And the true value is this red X, um, but you'll notice that the um, the minimum of this negative log likelihood surface is actually not at X, and that's due to sampling variability. Because this is a simulation, I just drew some random X, some random Ys. Um, so as the sample size goes to infinity, um, this uh, minimum should converge to the true X, but in any finite sample, it, it won't be exactly the same. So, um, if I do simple gradient descent, starting from this point over here, you can see it just simply follows the, the path of least resistance. Um, if I use an adaptive gradient method, such as Avagrad, which is quite similar to the, the Atom optimizer that folks probably heard of, um, it, it tends, you can imagine rolling a ball down the well and it kind of sloshes around a little bit before it settles at the final optimum. Um, and then finally, Fisher scoring, it kind of jumps all over the place, um, but it does eventually um, get back to, to the right place. So they all converge, and I'm not going to show newton raphson because it actually um, had numerical problems because it, it went too far and went off to infinity. Um, so that's another thing is Fisher scoring, you know, perhaps has more numerical stability than, than newton raphson So in terms of the number of steps that it takes to converge, um, the Fisher scoring uh, converges much in many fewer steps because it, each step is using more information. It's using this, the curvature as well as just the gradient. Um, and the difference between regular gradient descent and Avagrad is not that big for this particular example. Hey, Will, this is Alex. If I can ask a small question. Sure, um, yeah. How, how do you assess convergence of each of these methods? Oh, for this example, this is just a toy example. So I just compute the, um, the objective function at each iteration. And if the change in the objective function is less than whatever, 10 to the minus six or something, then I declare that it's converged. <laughs> but there's many different ways. You can look at um, the, the norm of the gradient and things like that. Um, I mean, that, that is a problem that's global to optimization in general. What's the best way to assess convergence? Um, so, uh, yes, so to summarize, um, the initialization makes a big difference. So here I, init I intentionally initialize kind of far from the true value um, just to show the optimizers in action. But in practice, you would probably fit um, some crude um, linear regression, you know, to start with, and then that would give you an initialization that was much closer to the true value. Um, Hey, Will, sorry, yeah. Alex, again, there is a question in the chat from Stephen Fleming, uh, which is asking about comparison of computation time, uh, I guess, across first order, yeah. second order, and various variants of each. 
Great question, and that is exactly what I was going to say next. Um, even though I kind of made the Fisher scoring look better uh, in the previous bar graph, um, each even though it takes fewer iterations, each iteration is slower to do because you have to compute the inverse of this of this matrix. So the scaling is going to be like O of um, k cubed, like the the number of um, variables cubed. So if you have a large number of um, of covariates. Um, this thing is really going to get bogged down and you might be better off taking more steps uh, that where each step is cheaper to compute because the gradient um, scales linearly in the number of parameters, whereas the, um, the Fisher information, the inverse of that is going to be uh, uh, cubic. And then also the memory consumption is going to be quadratic um, for, for the second order methods. Um, yeah. Okay. So now, in the time I have left, I want to briefly um, get into latent factor models. Um, so GLMs are supervised learning, where you have covariates and you want to see how they affect the outcome. Um, but with a lot of this genomic stuff and, and other you know, more recent modern data sets, you have just a lot of measurements. You just want to kind of like discover structure. You don't really know what is the cause and effect or what is the, you know, the thing that you're um, perturbing and then you want to observe what happens. So in this more unsupervised setting, um, uh, more common um, strategy would be something like dimension reduction or, or clustering. Uh, and it's really more of an exploratory type of analysis. Um, so this is the way I think about at least linear dimension reduction. You have like a giant matrix um, and you want to just decompose it into two smaller matrices that maybe are easier to graph or easier to, to, um, to interpret. Um, principal component analysis or PCA is by far, you know, the most common approach. Um, and um, this is kind of um, a cartoon of what it does. It, it, you can think about your data is in this high dimensional space and you have sort of a hyperplane that you're going to rotate around until it lines up um with uh with the space that the that the data um fits in um i think everybody's probably seen this already but um if you do pca on um snips um you can often recapitulate ancestry even if you a geographic ancestry um even if you don't give that information to the to the model um, so writing out the um, probabilistic version of PCA is very reminiscent to um, linear regression or a Gaussian GLM. Um, and the, um, all you're doing is essentially, instead of saying that you know what the X uh, vector is, you're going to say, I don't know X. I'm going to replace this with some latent factors that I'm going to also have to estimate. Um, instead of just the beta being estimated, I have to estimate both the U and the V. Um, so the log likelihood of this is essentially a constant um, minus um, the sum of the squared errors between the predicted mean from the factors and the, um, the data. And so this um, maximum likelihood uh, problem is essentially equivalent to minimizing the Frobenius norm of this uh, residuals matrix. And there's a theorem called Eckhart-Young um, which says that the, the closed form optimal solution is given by a singular value decomposition. But that is only the case for um, this particular cho choice of norm. Um, and in theory, we could also solve this optimization problem by just taking the gradient and um, doing uh, some kind of, of gradient, iterative gradient-based solution. We just don't do it because that's slower. But if we were to do that, that opens the door to um, getting rid of the Gaussian assumption. So that, that was uh, something that I explored as part of my dissertation. And we came up with this GLM PCA idea. Um, I mean, it turns out that it's really, um, it, it was previously discovered independently by um, Collins. Um, and he called it exponential family PCA. I'm sure many other people have also come up with it. I'm definitely not the first one to think of this idea. Um, but um, essentially all of the ideas that I've previously showed you about GLMs um, could be extended to this latent factor um, situation. And then it turns out that the um, GLM PCA is actually just a special case of this even more um, 
um, interesting class of, of latent factor models um, called generalized bilinear models, which is going to be the subject of, of Jeff's talk. Thanks to Will for a really great primer. Um, Will and I had many conversations uh, while he was a, a PhD student at Biostats on models related to this. And he definitely um, inspired some of the things that I'm gonna tell you about today. Um, so uh, I'm also particularly excited to talk to this audience to get your um, comments and feedback on this work. Um, I'm excited to hear what you have to say and what you think. So this is uh, joint work with Scott Carter, who I think many of you will know. He's, he's a Broad person as well. Um, and uh, um, uh, if you would like to follow along, I did post the links to the preprint and the slides in the chat. So feel free to pull those up if, you, if you'd like. All right, so the talk is on inference in generalized bilinear models. Um, and by inference, I mean uncertainty quantification. We're also gonna talk about estimation. So this work is uh, inspired by sequencing data. So we get these large matrices of counts um, in sequencing. Uh, for example, if you're doing copy ratio estimation, like you have coverage data in cancer genomics, which could be whole exome or whole genome. Um, if you're doing copy number variation in genetics, uh, if you're doing RNA-seq analysis uh, to study, say, differential expression uh, in gene expression, and uh, uh, many other applications like that. So uh, this, uh, that's kind of the inspiration. Um, and uh, oftentimes when we're analyzing these types of data, latent factor models uh, are useful. So there's kind of two cases, one in which you're interested in the latent factors and one in which you aren't. So um, Will mentioned that, for example, PCA is very often used to try to understand some sorts of like hidden variation um, which could be interesting to understand. In that case, you want to see the latent factors. In other cases, latent factors could represent batch effects um, or other unobserved covariates that you don't care about and that you want to eliminate. So these types of models are useful for both of those cases um, separately and potentially even simultaneously. Now, a challenge in these types of models is that um, estimation, as Will mentioned, uh, is difficult and even more challenging is inference or uncertainty quantification. Um, so I'm gonna uh, present algorithms for both inference and estimation um, with a particular emphasis on uh, inference or uncertainty quantification. So because of the, the difficulty of um, inference, oftentimes when people um, use latent factor models, they don't fully account for uncertainty in the latent factors. And as a consequence, that can lead you to be uh, overconfident in um, your inferences about other things, like if you're doing differential expression, for example, or you're detecting copy number variations or things like that. So this talk is on a, a particular class of latent factor model called a generalized bilinear model. It's fairly general, um, but not you know, uh, quite as complex as many of the models that people use in, in modern applications. But it's, um, it's sort of uh, simple enough uh, that we can still do some nice things with it and um, have some, some nice theory for identifiability and so forth. Um, so what are generalized bilinear models? Well, they're a flexible extension of generalized linear models, which Will talked about, to include latent factors, as well as uh, row covariates and column covariates and interactions between the rows and the row and column covariates. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to uh, describe algorithms for estimation and uncertainty quantification in these types of models, uh, which are um, fast and accurate uh, as far as we can tell. They uh, provide um, accurate estimation and accurate uncertainty quantification in simulations. Um, I'll also apply them to real data. Um, I'll get to that in a sec. But in particular, we introduce a method called delta propagation, which as far as I know is new. Um, it's a technique for propagating uncertainty among the different parts of the model um, using uh, basically the delta method, if you're familiar with that from statistics. I'll uh, present simulation studies, assessing the performance of the algorithms, and then apply the models to um, two problems, one, copy, copy ratio estimation in cancer genomics, and two, 
uh, gene expression using RNA-seq. Okay, so outline of the talk is going to be, um, I'll present the class of models, the generalized bilinear models, um, present some initial results on uh, identifiability and interpretability. I'll cover previous work, uh, the estimation algorithm, the inference algorithm, and then applications to copy ratio estimation and RNA-seq analysis. All right, so feel free to jump in at any point. I'm more than happy to take questions. Um, so um, feel free to put them in the chat. I may or may not see them in the chat or just pipe in if you want to ask a question. OK, so uh, what is a, a, a generalized bilinear model? Um, so the basic idea is um, if you saw Will's talk, he talked about generalized linear models um, where you have a link function g, um, which maps the mean of the outcome variable y to um, some linear function of your parameters, um, or in this case, actually, a um, nonlinear function, which is also has these quadratic terms. So you can visualize the GBM here in this, this diagram above. The inputs, uh, or the things which are known, are the data matrix Y, which I'm going to think of as a, an I by J matrix. It could be real valued. It could be uh, counts or something else, potentially. Uh, a matrix of covariates X, um, which is I by K. Uh, and a matrix of sample co of covariates Z, um, which is um, J by L. Now, um, the X matrix can be thought of as feature, uh, feature covariates. These are sort of like row-specific covariates. And the Z matrix is like sample covariates. Um, in this case, we're thinking of the samples as being on the columns and the features, which could be genes, could be targets, uh, like geno genomic uh, region targets. Those are going to be on the rows. All right, so um, the model here is uh, that the, uh, the mean of y, we're going to assume that we have some outcome model for y, which uh, satisfies the following equation. The mean of y, when mapped through this g function, this link function g, um, can be decomposed uh, as a sum of these terms. The first one is xa transpose. The second one is bz transpose. The third one is xcz transpose. And the fourth one is the latent factor term um, udb transpose. Now, all of these uh, four terms are low rank matrices. So this is, uh, in general, a low rank decomposition of um, this function of the mean of y. In, in uh, sort of equation form, um, the model is here. So um, as Will mentioned, uh, I think Will talked about like having just UV transpose. I'm going to put the D in there, um, which is kind of reminiscent of like the SVD, the singular value decomposition. All right, so I'm going to refer to this as a generalized bilinear model. The term I think was actually coined by uh, Chalakian uh, in a paper in the 90s. Um, and the bilinear part here is this UDV term. Um, and it's called bilinear because it's not linear in the parameters. It's uh, quadratic. Uh, well, at least if it was UV transpose, it's quadratic. The D we kind of think about as we sort of don't really think about that as um, uh, counting in this bilinear. I guess it could be like trilinear or something, but that's sort of getting more general. Uh, Jeff, small yeah, question, yeah. if I may. Uh, are C and D uh, square matrices? Uh, yes. So um, C is a square matrix, which is, um, uh, in the notation I will use, it's K by L. So it has to conform here with the dimensions of X and Z. Um, D, I'm uh, making a square matrix also. Uh, and it's going to be a diagonal matrix with all the entries on the diagonal being positive. There are different ways of um, representing, uh, like the singular value decomposition of a uh, a low, of a matrix. And uh, in this case, I'm choosing what's called a compact uh, representation, which has all positive entries on the diagonal of Z uh, of D. Excuse me. Does that answer the question? Uh, almost. So C, you said is K by L, 
Right. Okay, right. Yeah, that makes sense. So we can have different number of um, feature covariates and sample covariates. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. So, so intuition here. Think about like, for example, if um, it's targets along the genome or um, genes. Let's say genes, for example. Um, then X could contain things like GC content um, or some nonlinear function of GC content, like splines. Um, as well as an intercept, I'm also going to include a column of ones for intercepts. Z could be things like if you have observed batches, for example, um, then you could put that as a sample covariate, or it could be sample material type or something like that. Fantastic. And I, I assume you'll probably talk about this, so maybe I'll just ask, and if you're going to talk about this, you know, answer it later. But uh, Usually when we want to adjust for some covariates, we would only have the first few terms without the green stuff. And so it's the idea now to kind of find the remaining structure uh, after regressing out things that we want to regress out. Um, it could be uh, both ways. So, so one possibility is that you're interested in the remaining structure, um, which could be informative uh, for whatever problem you're trying to uh, address. In other cases, you may actually be interested in the covariates. For example, if you're doing differential expression and gene expression, then you would want to test whether some entries of this B matrix are non-zero. Um, so um, uh, differential expression problems could, can be represented in that way. In that, in that case, you may want to adjust for this U um, DB term in order to get rid of batch effects, which are unobserved. Uh, but, wouldn't you adjust for it just by taking the residuals? Okay, never mind. I'll, I'll probably think okay. about this more. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Other questions before I continue? Please feel free to. I, I, I guess no. I guess I did have the same question, so I'm going to ask okay. it, even though Alex, uh, Alex did, and I'm going to I'm going to say again. So, well, how is this different from kind of first? Uh, projecting out in some sense these residuals. It seems like in some sense it's probably more principled, but um, can you speak right. a bit? Yeah, sure. So if uh, the outcome model is normal and um, this, this G here is just like the identity. So if this was like a, a normal model, like if it was Y equals this thing plus some normal residuals, then it actually turns out that you can just um, do linear regression to fit uh, this, these linear parts, the A, B, and C terms, subtract them off, look at the residuals, and then um, do singular value decomposition or PCA basically on the residuals to estimate the UDV term. And that gives you the, um, uh, the maximum likelihood or least squares solution to the parameters. But that's only in the normal case. Uh, so uh, if you want to go to generalized uh, models where the outcome is like Poisson or negative binomial or something else, um, then that doesn't work anymore. There's some sort of relationship where you have to um, adjust for both of them simultaneously. Right, that makes sense. You can't just regress or project out counts on, uh, sorry, uh, covariates on the scale of the counts, for example. So yeah, thanks. Right, right. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. Um, and also, just want to remark the diagram on top is very clear and really easy to follow. So nicely done. Great, great. Okay, feel free to jump in. Any other questions? So the green stuff is both the covariates that you didn't measure and the latent structure, which are in some sense the same. Although some of it might be technical, some of it might be exactly the exactly. thing you actually want to discover, right? Exactly. Some of it could be technical um, artifacts that you don't care about and that you want to get rid of. Some of it could be um, uh, very, you know, covariates that you didn't observe. Some of it could be biological structure that you actually really want to uncover, like maybe, you know, different um, subtypes of uh, tissues or something like that. Cool. Cool. All right. All right, so um, a bit a first question that might come up um, mathematically when you look at this model is identifiability. Um, so in statistics, we always try to ensure 
that the parameters of a model are uniquely determined by the distribution of the data so that um, we can uniquely recover them. Uh, and uh, it turns out that in this model, you do actually have identifiability. We um, have a result in the paper proving that under certain constraints, um, the parameters are identifiable. Uh, these are the constraints here. Um, I won't go through them in detail, but um, you can check them out if you'd like. Basically, there's some um, orthogonality constraints on the matrices, orthonormality constraints on the U and V matrices, um, uh, and some things to make sure that the SVD uh, or that this decomposition is unique for UDV, like the, DAC. the D needs to be ordered, um, and uh, something to make sure the signs of the U's and V's are, are consistent. Um, and so uh, mathematically then, to say it a little more precisely, this function uh, eta of these uh, six matrices, A, B, C, D, U, and V, um, which is the linear predictor, as Will mentioned, um, in a GLM, now we're kind of generalizing that to this GBM context. This linear prediction, linear predictor is a one-to-one -one function on the set of parameters that satisfy these constraints, i.e., uh, they are identifiable. Okay, and actually it's a little stronger and it depends on your definition, I guess, of identifiable. They're uniquely determined by the mean of the matrix, um, which is uh, less information than the whole distribution. Now for interpretability, it's also nice to impose some constraints on X and Z. Um, in particular, it's nice to make the first column of X and the first column of Z all ones and then make the rest of the columns have mean zero. Um, making the first column all ones actually allows you to decompose. If we look at just one entry, if I go back a sec, um, one entry of this, um, uh, this matrix here, which is just like G of the mean of YIJ, you can uh, decompose that, you can rewrite it in this way. So now because it's, uh, you know, I'm writing it in the univariate form. We have these sums. And um, it turns out that uh, the uh, first entry of the C matrix is the overall intercept. If you take the average of all the entries I and J, then you get just C11. The A, um, so the first um, column of the A matrix is like a sample specific offset. The first column of the B matrix is a feature specific offset. So these are like adjustments to that intercept. And then the effect of the different covariates can be decomposed in this way. It, uh, it involves sort of an overall sort of effect, the CK1 for the kth feature covariate, plus a sample specific offset um, for the x's. And then likewise, by symmetry, um, uh, the ELT sample covariate, the effect can be decomposed into a overall sort of average effect, um, C1L, and then a um, uh, feature specific offset to that. Then we have the actually interactions. Um, the interaction matrix is only um, the C matrix. It's sort of like excluding the first uh, row and column. Um, you have interactions between the, the sample and feature covariates and then the, um, the uh, bilinear part. So this helps with interpretation um, of the model parameters. All right, now for the outcome distribution, in other words, the distribution of Y given the parameters, um, we're gonna consider discrete exponential dispersion families. So this is kind of a uh, generalization of exponential families, which Will talked about to allow dispersions. Um, uh, and then there's a particular way of um, defining the model so that it's more natural for discrete data like counts. Specifically, we're gonna suppose that the the probability mass, mass function of uh, yij has this functional form. So it sort of looks a lot like an exponential family distribution, where here theta is the natural parameter, uh, y is um, the outcome, uh, kappa of theta is uh, the cumulant function that, that Will talked about. But now we have this r also, um, which is capturing dispersion. Here r is actually the inverse dispersion, sometimes people parameterize it as one over R, which is the dispersion. Now, it turns out that for any discrete exponential dispersion family, um, the mean mu of, uh, of Y is R times the derivative of 
of kappa, and the variance sigma squared is r times the second derivative. So here, theta, this natural parameter, is uh, univariate. Now, for sequencing data, uh, uh, we're going to focus on negative binomial outcomes, which are particularly nice um, for this application because um, the technical variability in sequencing tends to be Poisson or pretty close to Poisson. And when you allow for over dispersion of a Poisson, um, that a natural way to do that is with a negative binomial. So a negative binomial can be thought of as a, a Poisson with a gamma prior on um, the parameter integrated out. And this is actually a special case of this discrete exponential dispersion family form. Now, um, we're going to, because we want to allow for uh, entry specific, well, not exactly a different uh, dispersion for every entry, but we want to allow for, um, to go beyond just one single common dispersion. We parameterize the dispersions, which is one over R, um, as having a basically a rank one structure. So E to the SI plus TJ plus um, some omega. Uh, and this allows to have a um, feature specific log dispersion and a sample specific log dispersion. Okay, um, any questions on that before I move along. All right, I'll move right along and try to get through uh, this. So there is a huge literature on models um, involving a low rank matrix. And they go by a, a large number of names, latent factor models, factor analysis models, um, bi-additive models, bilinear models. Um, and there's no way I can cover uh, all of it. Uh, so what I'm gonna try to do is just focus on the stuff which is most directly related to this particular way of defining the model. So the first special case to think about is um, if you have a normal outcome uh, and no covariance. So if you write the model uh, this way, so yij is some overall intercept plus uh, ai plus bj plus some latent factor stuff here, um, and then a normal residual epsilon ij then um, you get, sometimes it's called a AMI model, A-M-M-I, um, but basically it's, uh, you can think of it as, this is basically what principal components analysis uh, is doing. If you think of it as a, as a probabilistic model, um, it's, it's very close to assuming this model and then doing maximum likelihood estimation. So if you, if you fix the variances, uh, the sigma squared ij's to all be the same, um, and you do maximum likelihood estimation in this model, that's um, equivalent to subtracting off the rows and the columns, the means of the rows and columns, which is basically where these C, A, I, and B, J get estimated, and then doing PCA like uh, with a singular value decomposition to estimate this part. Um, now, estimation for this model goes way back. Um, there's uh, an enormous literature on the use of this type of model. Um, in particular, uh, uh, there's a lot of work on hypothesis testing for which factors to include, which is quite interesting. And there's also work on uh, un uncertainty quantification for the parameters, um, for example, defining confidence regions. So that's the first special case. Uh, now, if we want to add covariates, um, what we can do is take this GBM, but now just assume, like I mentioned before, that um, instead of uh, having a, uh, like a GLM outcome, we're just going to have a normal outcome. So here, this epsilon is a matrix of normal residuals. Uh, and um, work on this model actually was inspired by Tukey, who had a, a, a a really influential paper where he suggested combining regression with factor analysis. Um, and a lot of work on this model actually assumes a common variance for all entries. Again, this, if sigma ij equals sigma, then things are much simpler. Um, you can do the thing which I mentioned before, which is you just, you can just fit, uh, you know, using least squares, the a, b, and c parts here, and then do PCA on the residuals to estimate udb. Now, things are more complicated if you allow a general uh, sigma squared ij. Actually, it gets um, substantially more complicated. Um, 
but uh, there has been some work on that as well. Now, hypothesis testing uh, and confidence regions for uncertainty quantification. Um, there has been uh, some work on that as well, not as much as far as I have been able to find, but there's a nice paper by Perry and uh, Pillai um, showing how to perform inference for uh, univariate linear projections of the A and B matrix, accounting for uncertainty in the latent factors. All right, now we would like to be able to go beyond normal outcomes uh, to handle count data, for example, you know, in sequencing. Um, and a, a classical approach uh, to doing that is to just transform the data. For example, maybe like you take a uh, log uh, of the data plus a pseudo count or some other transformation like square root, and then just apply a normal outcome model. The issue with that is that um, there are some implied assumptions in doing that. Um, and unfortunately, it's unlikely to, that there will be any transformation that simultaneously gives you approximate normality, a common variance of all the entries, and additive effects. So the more principled approach, or a more principled approach, is to use the GLM framework. Uh, and this was suggested in a paper by Gallen. Um, so the, the first case is to use a generalized linear model sort of outcome, um, but uh, include these latent factor terms and no covariance. Um, so uh, estimation for this type of model uh, uh, has been done. There's a, you know, a series of papers uh, on this type of model and actually hypothesis testing as well. But the general, general case that we would like to consider is uh, GBMs with covariance. Um, and uh, as far as I can tell, work on this type of model goes back to this paper by Cholakian. Um, there's also a, a very nice paper by Gabriel uh, an overview uh, paper and Will Towns paper. And there, I'm sure, are other papers that are doing more general things um, uh, and things very closely related to this or even this exactly. Um, but these are just the ones that, uh, that I was able to, to reference here. So, um, um, Jeff, please. do you mind if I ask a quick question? Um, okay. Something that comes to mind is, is uh, Bayesian uh, approaches to the count case with a with latent low dimensional right. structure like the hierarchical Poisson factorization for recommender right. systems and things like that. Can you can you make a brief comment on how that relates or does not? Sure. So there's yeah, I mean there are many models um, where people use uh, latent factorization. For example, in, in that um, there's, uh, I believe the GCMV model um, has a latent factor component in a, along with a hidden Markov model component, which is, um, you know, much more sophisticated. Um, and Bayesian methods, uh, in particular variational methods are um, often used in those types of models. There's also um, a nice paper uh, by Butner et al, which is uh, for single cell RNA-seq and they have a latent factorization as well. They use variational Bayes. Um, so there are definitely many papers that uh, beyond what I listed here that um, can be thought of as uh, being in this form. Uh, one limitation, uh, I think a big limitation of variational Bayes is that um, it assumes that when you do variational Bayes, you use a factorized approximation to the posterior, which uh, tends to underestimate your uncertainty and in, in these models, uh, I think that could be problematic because there are some strong dependencies between parameters. And when you know, the posterior is concentrated in you know, close to some subspace, then that can cause real issues for variational Bayes. So actually, Tamara Broderick has some nice work on accounting for uh, the covariance in variational Bayes. That could be something interesting um, to pursue as a generalization. Nice. That, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Cool. Right. So limitations of um, this particular kind of line of previous work, uh, uh, kind of more from the frequentist perspective, is that uncertainty quantification is not addressed. Of course, there is the variational Bayes stuff and MCMC methods as well. But um, from the frequentist perspective, uh, uh, and then usually a single common dispersion parameter is assumed and the identifiability constraints are not explicitly enforced. So um, what kind of, I actually come from more of a Bayesian background myself. 
but I was really interested in coming up with um, estimation and uh, uncertainty quantification algorithms for this that would be really, you know, fast and easy to use and reliable and wouldn't require the user to kind of have to wait for an MCMC chain to run and potentially not converge and then have to worry about that. So that's kind of the motivation for the frequentist perspective uh, or approach that I'm going to present here. Let me see the time check. All right, 11.30. So um, uh, I'll describe a algorithm for maximum a posteriori estimation, which you know, as a, you know, from a strictly Bayesian perspective, it's not really Bayesian, you know, to be truly Bayesian, you want to use the posterior. Um, really here, the, um, we're using uh, a map estimator because it provides some regularization. All right, and this extends previous work in, in these ways, estimating the dispersion parameters for rows and columns, improving numerical stability, um, and explicitly enforcing these identifiability constraints. The basic idea of the estimation algorithm is, is really simple, actually. It's, it's basically like a coordinate ascent algorithm. Um, if you're familiar with coordinate ascent, you, you decompose the parameter space into different parts and you optimize each of them um, separately, uh, holding the others fixed, and you just cycle through. Um, you're gonna use a uh, variant of that idea where we first do an unconstrained optimization on each part and then project it onto the constrained space to enforce the identifiability constraints. And um, to do that projection, we use a likelihood preserving projection, which is important to avoid, uh, you know, kind of taking one step forward and then two steps back in terms of the model fit when you do the projection. If you're not careful about how, careful about how you project, you can just really mess up the likelihood. Now, um, that's the general, the basic idea, but there's a lot of tricky details. So I'm just gonna mention some of the challenges um, and you have to check out the paper to see the details of how we solve them. Um, estimating the dispersions, as Will mentioned, is really tricky, actually, surprisingly tricky. Um, there are, uh, some of the issues are there's non-obvious biases um, when you're doing the optimization, it's easy to run into arithmetic overflow and underflow issues. Occasionally, there will be lack of convergence of the algorithm due to sort of weird things that happen. Another challenge is that um, in this GBM model, you can't just do, you know, sort of standard GLM methods, um, like just like if you want to just do Fisher scoring, um, you can't just vectorize, like even if you didn't have the latent factor term, uh, if you try to just vectorize the A, B, and C, then you have this giant uh, matrix, which is going to be intractable to invert. So like doing Fisher scoring with that is, is computationally prohibitive. Um, optimizing this latent factor term is challenging due to there's these uh, dependencies between the parameters as well as um, these uh, nonlinear constraints. And um, although you might think that you could just throw this at an SVD to estimate UDV. You can't really um, because uh, the SVD implicitly assumes every entry has the same variance. So if you're using it for estimation, it doesn't really help you there. Um, another general challenge is that for big matrices, we need to have computational efficiency. Um, numerical stability of the algorithm is crucial. And so uh, Probably, you know, a, a really important aspect of that is having a good initialization. That tends to help a lot. Even with a good initialization, optimization, optimization methods sometimes diverge. Like Will mentioned, his newton raphson algorithm example diverged. Uh, and in a large model like this, there are so many parameters that even if the algorithm only diverged like once in a, you know, if it would normally only diverge once in a thousand times, because of the large number of parameters, it will it will like diverge like almost you know every single time, so you have to really be careful about numerical stability. And finally, um, it's not totally obvious how to in, uh, enforce the identifiability constraints in this model without compromising the convergence of the algorithm. So um, the estimation algorithm that we developed addresses these challenges. You know, I'm not going to say it's like the all-time, you know, final solution to this problem, 
but it does seem to work pretty well in the simulations and the real data that we've run it on so far. Um, so some of the key aspects are um, exploiting the special structure of this GBM model, the way that the factorizations um, are, are arranged to derive fast Fisher scoring updates. So rather than just updating like all of the parameters at once, which would be totally intractable, um, we update them in blocks uh, that uh, make things much more computationally tractable. Initializing is very tricky to do, um, particularly with the dispersions. If you're estimating the dispersions and the parameters, um, you can easily run into issues. So an approach that we found works well is to first fix the latent factors to just zero. Uh, this is sort of getting at um, it's not exactly the same, but it's for initialization. If you just fix the latent factors to zero and then fit the A, B, and C terms, the linear terms with least squares, that often provides a good initialization. Uh, now, for numerical stability, we use regularization in terms of the prior uh, or like an L2 penalization, and also bound the Fisher scoring steps, bound the, um, uh, the root mean square actually of the Fisher scoring steps, which tends to work quite well to prevent divergence. Um, we also provide uh, these likelihood preserving projections. And another uh, thing that we do is optimizing the U and V uh, matrices when you have the factorization U, D, V transpose. Because of these orthonormality constraints, if you just optimize them separately, it doesn't really work that well in uh, our experience. So we relax those constraints a bit by optimizing the, the product of U times D. So we define a matrix, say G, which is UD, and then optimize that and then project that. All right, so those are just a kind of a hint of the uh, solutions. All right, so we um, did a bunch of simulations um, uh, generating the covariates from a copula model with various, you know, with different marginals, um, generating the true parameters from different, uh, you know, schemes like a normal or a gamma, and then generating the outcomes um, using a log link and then various outcome distributions like negative binomial, log normal Poisson, Poisson or geometric. Um, so I'm going to focus on the negative binomial case in this talk, but we have other results in the paper if you'd like to check it out. Now, first, as just a typical example, um, here is uh, a single simulation run. And these are the estimates of all the parameters. So this is uh, every, so the results here are just for one single run, right? So this is a, a matrix, which is 1,000 by 100. Um, the data is generated using four feature covariates, two sample covariates, and three latent factors. And the entries of the A matrix are shown here, um, the estimates versus the true values. And as you can see, you know, they're, they're pretty close to the diagonal, which means that it's, um, it's getting, the estimates are close to the true values. In all these plots, you can see that things are, you know, more or less uh, along the diagonal, which means the estimates are, are doing well. One thing I'll just point out really quick is that in the S, this is the log dispersions for the um, feature specific. There's some bias here at the low end, which is one of the issues that needs to be dealt with. Okay, um, now uh, running the simulations over 50 uh, repetitions and then looking at the difference between the estimates and the true values, we can quantify um, the error in the estimates. And um, there are some parameters for which you would expect to have consistent estimates as, say, the number of rows goes to infinity with a fixed number of columns. Um, and that's what we're doing here, just to get a sense of the convergence um, as the data grows. So if uh, we fix the number of columns at 100 and let the number of rows increase, um, that's the, the plots that I'm showing here. And the relative mean squared error of the estimates for A, um, uh, C, V, and T appears to be going to zero, um, which is what you would hope to happen since the amount of information pertaining to each of those parameters is increasing. Other things like B and U and S, you would not expect to have um, 
consistency or convergence um, to the true parameters in that simulation setting. Um, D is uh, a little bit more complicated. Um, it's not exactly clear what's happening here, but it may be converging. It's not, I'm not sure. Okay, so in terms of the computational complexity, this algorithm uh, ends up being linear in the size of the matrix. So we have a, a decomposition here of each of the different steps in the estimation algorithm, the computational complexity. Overall, it ends up being um, I times J uh, in terms of that's the size of the matrix, IJ. And then K is the number of uh, feature covariates, L is the number of sample covariates, M is the number of latent factors. Um, empirically, we can verify uh, that theory. Um, so running the algorithm on uh, matrices of different size as I increases and as J increases, we see that the computation does indeed appear to increase linearly in both I and J. So that's good. So the, the algorithm itself is actually quite scalable. It's linear time in the size of the matrix. Um, and on really big data sets, I think the bottleneck is probably going to be memory. Um, so doing something to, you know, um, handle memory in a better way is probably going to be what's needed to, to extend this to really big data. All right, so that's the estimation algorithm. Um, and uh, for the inference algorithm, I'm going to also give you a little overview. And I realize I'm probably running a little late on time here, so I'll, I'll try to go quickly. Um, so there's um, a variety of uh, methods that people have used to do uncertainty quantification um, in latent factor models. Um, one approach is to just uh, treat a part of the latent factors as known and handle uncertainty in the other parts. Some approaches don't account for the uncertainty at all, just subtract it off. Um, that's pretty common in CNV methods. Um, Bayesian inference does provide full uncertainty quantification, but MCMC is slow. And as we discussed earlier, variational Bayes tends to underestimate um, uncertainty. So um, the approach that we take is uh, kind of inspired by the frequentist, the classical kind of frequentist theory, um, but extends it um, to uh, allow for this type of model. So in particular, we introduce uh, this technique that we call delta propagation, um, which is a general technique for propagating uncertainty between different components of a model. The nice thing about this delta propagation technique is that you can actually do it analytically using closed form expressions involving the gradient and the Fisher information. So the, the, the basic idea here is the inspiration is that if you just have a fixed dimensional parametric model, as Will mentioned, the asymptotic covariance of the maximum likelihood estimator is the inverse of the Fisher information matrix. But if you try to invert the full Fisher information, it's just intractable in this type of model. Um, now you could say, what if I just invert the Fisher information for one part of the model, like the A matrix? And you can do that computationally efficiently, but it drastically underestimates your uncertainty, basically because it's assuming that everything else is fixed and known. So you can think of it as kind of like the conditional uncertainty in like the A parameters given everything else. So what delta propagation uh, does is it tries to approximate the additional, uh, the additional variance in all those other parameters um, uh, due to the uncertainty in them. So when you're trying to quantify your uncertainty in A, it's going to add the variance due to uncertainty in all, everything else. And the basic idea mathematically of how we do that is to write the estimator for each component, like, like the A matrix, as a function of all the other components, and then propagate the variance of all those parameters through that function um, using a first order Taylor approximation. So if you're familiar with the delta method, it's the same basic idea. If you have a like approximately normally distributed thing and um, you map it through a function, then uh, the variance of the mapped version is like the, uh, you can use a first order Taylor approximation to derive that um, as a function of the variance of the thing you were mapping. Um, so I'm not going to go into the mathematical details of it, but just to give you a general sense of the outline of how the algorithm works, 
Um, we first quantify uncertainty in U and V since uh, so we tried like a lot of different ways of doing this and this has ended up working the best from what we could tell so far. Quantifying uncertainty in U and V jointly um, using the constraint augmented Fisher information, then using delta propagation to map that uncertainty to the A and B matrices, um, mapping from the A and B matrices to C using delta propagation, and then um, from A, B, U, and V to the log dispersion parameters S and T. Um, so it's sort of reminiscent of other kind of uncertainty propagation methods. Um, uh, you could actually try to extend this to like loopy delta propagation, which could be interesting, but we haven't explored that. Would, would, um... Would rejigging the, uh, the the sort of order or the dependency there um, be a way to check on the robustness of your answer? Like if you do it different ways, do you how consistent is it? Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, um, you know, I don't think it's. We aren't at a point yet where we um, have. A, so the way it's set up right now is that U and V represent kind of the the biggest part of the uncertainty. And we can do them first without having to propagate back to them and okay. reasonably good results. If you did something else first, you would probably, you have to like propagate back and then you'd have to do some kind of looping. And we just, you know, for this first version of the algorithm, we wanted to avoid any issues with kind of having loopy lack of convergence or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So we wanted to assess uh, first in simulation, the accuracy of the standard errors that you get from this algorithm. Um, and we did that using coverage, so frequentist coverage. Um, and ideally, a 95% confidence interval would contain the true parameter 95% of the time. But even if the model is exactly correct, that's not always guaranteed because confidence intervals are based on an approximation to the distribution of the estimator. So we use the same simulation scheme as before. First, I'm just going to throw up exactly the same um, slides with the scatter plots. And now I'll point out that these black vertical lines are actually um, plus and minus two times the standard errors. And you can see that they're kind of in the ballpark, right? You know, they're representing roughly the uncertainty or the, the variability of the estimates around the true parameters. To quantify that more precisely, we um, repeated the simulations 50 times and computed the, the coverage uh, for every target coverage level from zero to 100%, um, and then compared that to the actual coverage. And you can see that for A, B, and C, and probably U as well, the coverage is pretty good, actually. It's, I, I was pretty pleasantly surprised by how good we were able to get the coverage here. For other things, well, S also, it seems to be pretty good, which is uh, nice. Um, v, it tends to degrade as the size of the matrix in terms of the number of rows increases, as well as in T. Um, but for oftentimes the parameters of interest, like um, A and B, potentially C, um, uh, the coverage is, is pretty good. So that was really nice. Now, in terms of computational complexity, um, even though we have to run it only once, it's a little bit more expensive than um, the estimation algorithm. It turns out being uh, uh, linear in the number of rows and quadratic in the number of columns. Now you could always by symmetry flip it if you had more um, columns than rows, but this is the, you know, usually we're gonna have like a lot of columns and not as many rows. So I set it up this way. So it's like IJ squared basically. Uh, we tried a lot of things and didn't find an improvement to get it down to linear that would still give reasonably good uh, standard errors in terms of coverage. Uh, and then this is just the empirical uh, computation time. All right, so um, I have, I, I realize I probably should be stopping for questions now, but I'd like to get to the applications. Should I just keep going, Liz, or what do you think? Yeah, let's, let's get into it. Okay, all right, great. Feel free to stop me if you have questions. All right, so um, 
The first application I'm going to show you is copy ratio estimation uh, in cancer genomics, which I think many of you will be very familiar with. So um, copy ratio estimation, as uh, I'm sure many of you know, is an essential step in detecting somatic copy number alterations in cancer, which are du duplications or deletions of the genome. So the input here is a matrix of counts where the IJ entry is the number of reads from sample J that map the target region I of the genome. Um, this is also sometimes called coverage. So the goal here is to estimate the copy ratio of each region for each sample, um, which is uh, the relative concentration of copies of that region in the original DNA sample. So to illustrate this, um, we consider three, the 326 whole exome sequencing samples from the CCLE. Um, and I'm just going to put up uh, one example as an illustration here. Um, so this is a first a, a, a basic estimate of copy ratio from normalizing the rows and columns. So just taking, you know, dividing by the average of the rows and then the average of uh, the columns. Um, and I'm adding a little kind of pseudo count here to the data so that if we take logs, then things don't become zeros. So just to visualize the data and have a baseline estimate of copy ratio, um, I defined uh, this. So divide by the average of the rows, then divide by the average of the columns. So um, if you just do something simple like that, then unfortunately it's very noisy and it's contam contaminated by significant technical biases. So what we'd like to do is uh, use a model, uh, use some sort of model um, to improve that performance. Now, um, the leading methods for copy, re copy ratio estimation lose, use a panel of normals um, to estimate technical biases with PCA. So after you've done, so you have some panel of normal samples which are um, presumed to have no copy number alterations. You run PCA on those to estimate technical biases, and then you take the inferred factors and denoise your cancer samples to remove, hopefully, any technical biases. So GATK provides tools for doing this in the create recount panel of normals and denoise recounts tools. So um, to run these on the CCLE and to use our model for reproducibility purposes, um, I wanted to have something that anyone could have public access to the data. Um, so I created, rather than use normal samples from like TCGA or something, uh, created a pseudopon um, by basically uh, trying to estimate copy number alterations from these basic estimates and subtract them off. I won't go into the details of that, but you can check it out if you'd like. So um, if we create this kind of pseudopon um, in that way from half of the data, like a training set, and then use the other half as a test set, then um, we, we can run GATK and get uh, better copy ratio estimates. So on this particular example, you can definitely see there's a huge improvement over the basic row and column normalization from GATK. Um, uh, I should mention the red line here is, the, is just a moving average. The blue dots are the copy ratio estimates. So this is using a, a, a panel of normals or PON um, with five latent factors in the PCA. Now, um, to run a GBM to do copy ratio estimation, um, we used a negative binomial uh, GBM. Uh, and um, again, on the same split of training and test, uh, we first ran a GBM including the latent factors. So this is kind of like to make it directly comparable to the GATK approach. We first ran a GBM um, with, a, with five latent factors, to estimate the U, D, and V. We also included some region covariates, log length, um, GC content, and uh, basically like a quadratic function of GC content, no sample covariates, and as I mentioned, five latent factors. So this is the dimensionality of the model for the training set. And then on the test set, we took the inferred uh, U matrix, which is those latent factors representing kind of technical sources of variability, um, and then put them into the X matrix. So we took the inferred latent factors from the training data. And then when we ran on the test data, we defined them to be covariates, to be fixed covariates. 
That's not ideal for quantifying uncertainty, but we wanted to have a kind of direct comparison with GATK. So if we do that and then um, run the GPM uh, on this particular example for illustration, um, and also on other examples, sorry, hold on one sec. Sorry, right, the heat just kicked on and it's very loud. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, it's fine. Okay, so the, um, the performance does seem to be better. And one ad big advantage that we get in the GBM is that we can quantify the precision of each estimate. So if you remember in the model, we had these dispersion parameters and that actually allows you to define a, a precision or a variance or like a uh, inverse variance for each of these estimated copy ratios. So to illustrate that in this picture, um, I am plotting the uh, estimates with low relative precision in cyan um, versus the high relative precision in blue. And uh, you can see uh, that the estimates do seem to be, you know, less noisy and overall a little more locally constant. Um, to quantify that um, across all the samples rather than just that one, we looked at two performance metrics. Um, which we defined in a way that would take into account this, uh, these weights or precisions. Um, the first one is a local relative standard error, which you can think of as like the variability of these estimates around a moving average. And the second is a, a weighted median absolute difference. So one of the usual metrics that um, is used in copy, area, copy ratio estimation is the MAD, uh, the median absolute difference or median absolute deviation. And this is basically a weighted version of that. So in both of these metrics, um, the GBM uh, does appear to actually get better performance um, than this, um, at least the GATK on, on, in this beta, the way that we ran it. So that was pretty, um, you know, we were pretty excited about that. Um, and it seems that the improvement in performance is due to um, one, using model-based uncertainty. So the fact that we can provide these precisions uh, for each of the copy ratio estimates. And then also using a robust probabilistic model for count data rather than using PCA on uh, like a transformation of the counts. First took a random subset of 5,000 genes just to you know, make things a little more computationally tractable um, and fit a negative binomial GBM with two latent factors. So that's like PCA with the top two PCs, no sample covariates, and then using um, the log of the uh, some of the exon lengths, GC content, and a uh, quadratic function of GC content as gene covariance. So this model is uh, uh, running on a data set that's 5,000 by 8,551 with four um, uh, gene covariates. Uh, well, actually, I, it's the dimensionality is four. It's three gene covariates plus an intercept. Uh, one intercept for the samples and, um, and then uh, the latent factors, uh, in this case, two for visualization. All right. So if we do that on the uh, on GTEx, then you can actually see that, um, which has been you know very widely observed before, that the cluster that the data tends to cluster according to tissue type. Um, it's a pretty clean clustering, actually. Um, if you compare with, so well, first let me just explain the plot. So similar to PCA, I'm plotting the the two latent factors here. Um, and these are actually in the GBM. These are the entries of the V matrix. So if you recall, the V matrix um, in this case is a um, number of samples by two matrix. And so for each sample, you get these two uh, coordinates, which we can plot um, here. And so each dot in this, uh, this plot is one, um, one sample, one gene expression sample. So Jeff, I imagine that unlike PCA, if you made it, if you if you did three, um, then it wouldn't be true anymore that 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 the first two of them are the same as the case with two. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's a great observation. Um, so um, we've run this with you know two, three, four, five, six, and so on um, latent factors, and um, what you see is that it does change the first two latent factors, and what tends to happen is that um, things which were kind of combined here sometimes get separated. So tissues which were 
overlapping will get separated in higher dimensions. Um, and some things in the first two dimensions might not be as well separated because it's you have more dimensions to work with. Makes sense, yeah. But then maybe looking at a bunch of biplots or, or some 3D. Anyway, yeah, exactly. cool. Right, exactly, yeah. Sometimes, some of the things here, like um, the blue is uh, brain. And if you look at, there's a lot of sub tissues in, in the brain data. And um, this actually, if you plot the sub tissues colors, then you see that this structure tends to, this actually corresponds to sub tissues. Nice. Um, now, if you do something uh, more simple, like you just log transform the TPMs, like you take the TPM plus one, which I did here, and then take the log and then run PCA, um, it's much less uh, clear. So I think that there is an advantage of, of using the, the model-based approach here. Um, okay, so I just wanted to show how you can do visualization. And then um, to address this problem of finding aging-related genes, what we can do is take the model and add subject age as a sample covariate. So because of the, like, the really um, uh, diverse heterogeneity of this data, we just analyzed each, each sub-tissue separately. Um, you could actually add tissue or sub-tissue as a sample covariate, um, but uh, that makes, I mean, it, it does, you can run the model. It's, you know, it's computationally feasible, um, but that is still making a fairly strong assumption about the relationship between the tissues or sub-tissues. So um, to avoid having to make those assumptions, we just analyze them separately. Um, now, to be able to do valid hypothesis testing and exploratory model building, we took a random subset of 108 subjects um, to do uh, sort of an exploratory phase to choose covariates, choose a number of latent factors, uh, and figure out which tissues were more interesting for aging. Uh, and then and we set aside the remaining 436 subjects, which after the exploratory phase, then we just ran our selected model uh, on the selected data. All right. So um, to illustrate, um, I'm going to show you some results for the heart left ventricle subtissue data. Um, so after the exploratory phase, um, what we ended up doing based on that was we chose a model um, for these data um, that had the same actually gene covariates that I described before, log length, GC, and um, basically GC squared. And for the sample covariates, we include age, as I mentioned before, and also um, there is some substantial kind of technical variability in some of the, uh, the observed sample covariates, which um, one of them, which is particularly strong, was this exonic rate covariate. And then based on the exploratory um, phase, we chose to use three latent factors, which um, could be adjusting for some unobserved um, variability, which is not interesting for aging. You can check out the paper to see, uh, or I can explain it if you're interested, exactly what we did in the exploratory phase. Okay, so um, then um, running uh, the GBM on that data, how do we do inference for aging-related genes? Well, each gene in that model has a coefficient that describes how its expression changes with age. And um, using our GBM inference algorithm, we can get, um, well, we get standard errors, but then you can transform those into p-values to test whether each coefficient is non-zero. Um, using that approach, we found that 2,444 genes, um, that was out of, if I go back, uh, a little less than 20,000. Uh, so almost 2,500 were significantly associated with age in this tissue controlling error, uh, type 1 error at 0.05 using Bonferroni. So there's pre pretty strong aging effects in this tissue. We actually selected this tissue because the aging effects were so strong in the exploratory data. So um, for comparison, to see the power of uh, the GBM in this example, if you just take the log transform TPMs and do simple linear regression, you get one significant gene and instead of 2,444. So um, there's a pretty big improvement in, in power. Okay, so to illustrate, um, I'm gonna show you some data here first for the top hit in the GBM, which was um, this PCMT1 gene. Um, the p-value was around you know, 10 to the minus 47. 
Uh, so highly significant. Um, this gene actually is a well-known aging gene. It's involved in the repair and degradation of damaged proteins um, and is in, is in a list, a known list of aging genes. So if you look then at the, the GBM estimated uh, expression, which we can define using residuals um, of the model, the GBM estimated expression has a clear downward trend as a function of age. So um, each dot here is, uh, as a sample, uh, the x-axis is the age of the subject, and uh, the y-axis is the estimated expression of this PCMT1 gene. So this actually makes intuitive sense, you know, um, you know based on um, the fact that this gene, you know, according to the known biology, is potentially helping uh, tissues to stay healthy, um, and the fact that its expression is decreasing kind of makes sense. Now, if you look at, for example, here, the log transform TPMs, um, the trend is much less clear and there's um, quite a bit more noise as well. And in fact, um, it's, uh, the trend is not significant uh, for the log TPMs of this gene. There's a quick question from Tushar. Are these residuals with the modeling, including age as a covariate, or are they without it? Um, so this is, right, so it's, um, if you check out the paper, we talked about how to define residuals um, that adjust for some effects but not others. So here what we're doing is um, basically we are adjusting for everything except for age, roughly speaking. So age is not being adjusted out in this plot. Um, and that's, you know, so that's where, so the fact that age is not adjusted out allows you to see the trend um, as a function of age. Does that make sense? That's a, it's a really great question. So yes, that makes sense. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I had another quick question. Um, uh, it seems like uh, for the other model with the log TPM, you don't uh, correct for exonic rate. Uh, it's, and there's like a very large difference, 2,000 genes versus one gene. Is, does that matter? Um, the exonic rate, if you included that, or, and would that be a more fair comparison? Uh, yeah, so that's a really good uh, question. Um, it's definitely worth trying, trying that to see if that would help. Yeah, great question. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a note of that. All right, so no other questions at this moment. I'll continue. So um, we also then tested for um, enrichment of uh, Go ontology term gene sets um, using the top 1,000 GBM hits in this tissue. Uh, and this is just, I, you know, I realized that maybe the, it's kind of small um, font, but um, the, there were a number of uh, uh, gene, uh, gene ontology gene sets that were highly consistent with known aging biology that popped out of this analysis. So um, biologically, it, it's seeming to give uh, appropriate and interesting results for aging. Um, so this, this is for the biological process category, and this is for the cellular component category. 